Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Santa Clarita. Good morning. Good morning. I'm Tanya Mullery, and I'm the owner of Steamwork here in Santa Clarita. It's a community of entrepreneurs who have banded together, um, and WordPress plays an important role in our story. Um, and so yeah, during the course of today, I want to talk to you about why WordPress, um, why have I been using WordPress for nine years to grow my business, how to find your first paying client with WordPress, because I was hearing that a lot last night from some of the people I met at dinner, and then how to grow a WordPress business from that, and then um, how WordPress powers our community here in Santa Clarita, Steamwork. As Joe mentioned this morning, um, I met him at our public library because I was hosting a WordPress meetup, which was handed down to me from another gentleman. He had moved to um, Las Vegas, and I decided that this would be a great way to find people in the community that would be able to um, potentially become clients, that was one of the ideas, but also become resources to our growing agency and may want to get involved in our business community as we were starting to grow um, Steamwork. And um, just a little bit about me, I had a big old corporate career back in New York. I was an investment banker, then I worked for MasterCard for 10 years, pioneering lots of mobile commerce product development. Um, so if you guys seen the Apple Card, so a lot of the infrastructure and tokenization of the, the card number, uh, was that was part of my legacy at MasterCard. And I moved out to um, Los Angeles Mm, 12 years ago to work for a startup and the timing was very interesting. It was the week that the iPhone came out and I was had left this amazing job to move my family across the country for a VC funded startup um, which lasted nine months right before the crash. And so what happens when all of your plans kind of fall out underneath you? Well you try to figure out <laughs> what are your skills and how do you put them to work. Now at the time I had no skills in this area. I had done product development and project management and um, IT, enterprise IT um, products, but I hadn't done that necessarily for local businesses, but I started to train myself. And my first client, um, as somebody was saying yet last, yesterday, that they got $200 for the first paid website. And I was like, oh, that's so sweet, how nice. <laughs> I was so lucky because my friends were consultants and they gave me $9,000 to update their site, and I was like, wow, okay, that sounds like it could work. <laughs> I'll figure that out for $9,000, right? And so that's when my freelance career began, and I started to, um, I think it was a .NET framework, and I had to get in there and make changes to his site and, and figure it all out, and then I was like, there must be an easier way. Um, so I started investigating the tools that were available at that time. I was looking at Joomla and Drupal in the very beginning stages, and then over time I found WordPress and I fell in love. Um, why did I want to have a more, like instead of jumping back into corporate, why did I want to kind of go down this path? Well, I had, during my t 10 years at MasterCard, I had three uh, children. And my three boys now are teenagers, right? But at the time they were two, four, and six and I had just moved my entire family across the country to have a better work-life balance, and I was determined that I would have it. <laughs> so I definitely poured my heart into learning this and mastering it as, as best as I could. Um, over the course of time, though, I've also supplemented my WordPress business with being a startup advisor and marketing resource. So I'm into growth marketing, growth hacking, if you've heard those terms. And I also teach digital marketing and app design at, um, at USC for the last seven years. So that's a little bit about me. Um, by the end of this session, my goal is that you guys get to tap into your superpowers and figure out how your background can actually help you grow your agency, right? So do you feel like you have superpowers now that you know a little bit more about WordPress? Where does that sound like? We have a long way to go today. We have a long way to go? There's potential. I am telling you that WordPress is a superpower, but also combined with your natural background and superpower, you have way more credibility than you're probably yielding today. Wielding, sorry, yielding, wielding today. <gasps> My kingdom for a dongle. <laughs> I love it. That is a professional pack, I have yeah, to say. I found it like that. Excellent. <laughs> you never know when you're gonna need a weird okay. after. 
Right. I know. No, I just need to be. I I usually travel with my. I'm gonna just pack an HDMI everywhere I go. So. Um, nine years ago, I um, left a secondary corporate job I had at a digital marketing agency in the Omnicom family to start my own company. And that was the birth of what is now called Steamwork. And our anniversary is the 14th of April, so I'm like literally on the cusp of that. And we've built dozens of WordPress sites for small businesses, big businesses, nonprofits, schools, and startups, literally everybody who has any type of uh, commercially facing um, organization needs a, a website and WordPress is an excellent choice for that. Um, and then I told you a little bit about Steamwork. So why WordPress? And these are this is where I wish you could see these beautiful slides. But I think that WordPress provides a tremendous value for clients. First of all, uh, with it, the plethora of creative themes, and if you're a designer, forgive me, but I do love relying on a theme when the budget is important, um, that it's so customizable, powerful, flexible, and functional um, with its super SEO, and it's easy to find support. I think one of the things that I don't love about the ethics of our industry is when um, developers or, or uh, WordPress shops or try to lock down the site so much that the, the end use, um, customer doesn't have control over their sites. I find that to be really a challenging ethical dilemma um, because really it's an asset for the business and it, from my philosophy, respecting the um, rights of the, the client is always paramount. And so um, the freedom that WordPress can give to that client is that if they are working with somebody that's not great, they can go and find someone much more easily who can better support them and work within the ethical framework that is needed to rescue a project, right? So how many of you have worked on rescues before? Oh yeah, right. So being that good actor, in a sea of maybe not so great actors can be a really good positioning because people do need help and support. People do disappear. And oh man, I have, we could talk at Draconum later <laughs> about all of those stories. Um, the other thing is just WordPress is super easy to pitch to clients. They've heard of it, right? Which is always a win. That doesn't sound foreign to them. Um, and it powers 30% of the inter uh, internet. Everybody needs it. And most websites are kind of crap, right? So <laughs> they lack focus, they're designed badly, they have no objective, they don't work well on mobile devices. So you can kind of spot a bad website easily and then be able to pitch a better option to them. And the thing is, especially when you're starting, it's important to remember that just because you think WordPress is easy doesn't mean your clients do. They are still completely overwhelmed with the technology and you are the expert. You can position yourself as val very valuable to this business. You can be their hand holder, and I, I like to call it the website whisperer, right? Because what you do is magical to them. They have no idea how it's happening behind the scenes, but you also have an obligation to treat that power <laughs> with um, wisely. Okay, here we go. Hopefully. Yes. The other thing is WordPress is extra profit for you. If you are coding all these websites from scratch, oopsie. Okay, I hope strike that from the transcription. There was a naughty word. <laughs> okay, so you can get more done faster. You can get paid to not only to design and develop it, but to maintain it, which if you're not doing maintenance contracts then you're leaving money on the table. Um, you can get paid to build continuous content and to have a content uh, factory on your agency. And you can also get paid for custom enhancements. Your customers can stay with you for multiple years, right? Always upgrading, always enhancing, staying on maintenance, needing more content all the time. You can become a trusted advisor and then get paid to do other projects, get involved with their marketing, get involved with their strategy, get involved with their advertising, but it kind of started with that get the foot in the door um, WordPress project. <clears throat> Is this resonating for you guys? Do you do some of this too? Yes. This guy's like, I could give this talk. Let's go <laughs> chat. <laughs> okay. So the last thing I would say is in the why WordPress category is KISS. You know the KISS strategy? 
and not the band, right? <laughs> I like to say keep it simple, smarty, because I don't like calling people names, but that's okay. Uh, but keep it simple, smarty. Don't be greedy. Don't try to get the entire like year-long budget crammed into one project. Um, you'll overwhelm them. You'll lose the contract. Um, get paid quicker by doing the basics first. So in, in startup land, you have uh, the concept of minimum viable product. Have you guys heard this term before? It's called MVP. M as in Mary, V as in Victor, P as in Peter. <laughs> Minimal viable product. So get something simple done for them and then talk about phase two, phase three, phase four because it helps them understand that you're not trying to take advantage of them, that you're trying to get the important things taken care of first and that you can always you know, make enhancements and work and grow with their business. It, it offloads a lot of the risk up front from this project and this relationship and it gives you a steadier um, uh, pace for work as well as a steadier pace for income. Right, so I think the temptation is, well, let me get the big, big projects up front, but that's not necessarily um, the way to maximize your income. Okay, ta-da. <laughs> so, uh, based on the how to find your first paying WordPress client yesterday uh, conversation, update your sales, marketing, and delivery. Uh, so first of all, you should have a good WordPress website at a minimum, right? Because people will check you out. Um, your site is your 24 seven marketing and sales department. And you're also going to be telling your clients that their website is their 24 seven marketing and sales department. So if yours isn't working, if the links are broken, if the content's outdated, if your picture looks nothing like you today, <laughs> then you've got some things to update. So I would really make sure that you spend a little time on that and book out some time in your calendar on a regular basis to keep that up to date. Um, and have the content flowing regularly. Um, website must haves. Oh, this is fun. This is, this is good content right here, this blue screen. <laughs> like, you can't get that anywhere else, guys. <laughs> All right. Uh, website must haves. You should have case studies, client results, right? How have you improved your clients' businesses? Ooh. And testimonials. What do your clients say about you? Have they left reviews anywhere? Have you asked them for testimonials? Have you asked them to give you feedback on your project? Um, even if they wrote you a letter saying, oh, thank you so much, our new website is great ask, hey, do you mind if I put that on my website and put a picture of your site and a link back to you? And that way we keep promoting each other and we keep supporting each other. So the deeper you make those links, the better off you're, um, you'll be in developing your community of customers that can help advertise your business. Um, if you've gotten good press, awards, or other trust marks, like maybe you've, um, you've done an article in the Huffington Post or something like that. Well, make sure you keep adding content to the site. If you uh, have been um, named like Entrepreneur of the Year, so I can't remember what the name of the award was. I won a couple years ago. And now I'm thinking, that's not on my site. What's wrong with me? You should have that kind of stuff on your site because that enhances people's trust and that you're a good, um, good at what you do, but also a good person. You've been recognized by people they trust. Um, the other thing I would recommend is talk a little bit about the process. What should they expect when they go, go to work with you? How does your process work? Do you have a discovery session with them? Do you then go into a design phase? Do you, um, you know, then go into a development phase? Talk about the phases of your project. One thing I found is that people who are, especially people who are on the more technical side of WordPress, they tend to overwhelm clients with um, the technical steps. And I would encourage you to not use jargon and not confuse them. Um, if you're working with local businesses particularly and you throw a wireframe at them, they literally have no idea what that is. And they're like, well, why are you giving me boxes? This is not a website. I want a website, right? And so it takes a lot of education. But if you show them pictures of here's what I'm gonna do first, here's what I'm gonna do second, here's what I'm gonna do third, this is what it means, this is the feedback I expect from you at each of the stages of the process. The clarity of your communication will make them feel comfortable and they won't feel surprised or under duress. So 
um, I was working with um, one of our local WordPress uh, resources here in town and we were working with a local cake shop and this woman is fabulous. She's been in business for 40 years. Unbelievable, right? A, a business success story. And we were really excited to do this website for her for her anniversary and she'd been through a few different um, prospect, you know, prospective firms to work with and she finally was like, we, I feel really comfortable with you guys. But it's, she gets overwhelmed when you present something that's just too much for her or you ask her for too much content at the same time or too many pictures or, or present something that's unfamiliar. She, that she's just not able to process it in the scheme of all the other things that she has to get done in her business. And so being really careful with how you dose out the updates and dose out the, um, the content requests makes a big difference. And also make sure they can contact you. That should be on your website. <laughs> I know that seems really like a dumb thing to say, but such a big mistake I see people make is if they cannot get to you, if you have no phone number, email, or web form, people can't figure it out, they move on. They go to the next, the next person they find in their Google listings, right? So make sure they can contact you. So those, those items are trust builders and knowledge builders, and they're laid out on the slide very nicely. <laughs> okay, glad I did this. Um, and thank you so much for helping to try to figure this out. I appreciate all the work you're doing while we're doing this. Okay, so the other thing is getting good at selling. Everybody hates the word sales, right? How many, okay, raise your hands. Do you like, I hate selling? Just a minute. I know it's true. We all hate this word. Why do we hate this word? It's such a silly thing. What if you used a different word? What if you just said that sales is service? You're just telling people how you can serve them and seeing if there's a match. What if you actually changed it to this whole idea of servant, um, servant leadership or service to the client, and all you're doing is putting out a menu like a restaurant, and you're saying, here's how I can help you. I'm gonna help showcase your expertise, products and services. I'm gonna connect you to more customers. I'm gonna help you deliver content. I'm gonna get you found. I'm gonna be your sales and marketing 24 seven. And by the way, it's all gonna work automatically. You don't have to keep paying me like you would pay a salesperson in that you would have to give a salary. And our maintenance contract is a fraction of the salary. Oh, oh, oh. So this thing is gonna keep serving me all day and night, 24 seven, 365. Well, that sounds good to me, right? Doesn't it change the conversation when you stop thinking about, well, I just need the money. So, and I need, they have the money, so I need the money, so let's talk. It has nothing to do with the money. It has to do with the value you're delivering to the business and how their customers are going to find them and, and become deeper, longer lasting uh, fixtures in their business. So let's get good at service, not sales, right? Let's express our value in a different way. Okay, the next thing is to make sure in the, the process, it isn't about, like I said, selling, it's about asking questions. Good questions to ask is, what's a good client worth for you? Why? Because you can really get a lot of information about what their budget for their website might be. Okay, and here's why. What if they are um, an oncologist and a good client is worth you know, $50,000 a year to them. I don't know what that number is, right? I actually haven't done an oncology site, but I'm just pulling something out of the air. More? More? Okay, here you go. <laughs> How much is a good no, website worth to an oncologist um, to get one more well, client? I'm a cancer patient, and I know okay. that as a cancer patient, uh, you're worth at least $800,000 during your lifetime. Okay. So, yeah. so should they pay more than $2,000 for a website? Easy. Yeah, same yeah. grand. Very good, okay, good answer, good answer. Now we're, now we're talking. How about a lawyer? What's, I don't know, a general litigator? What, what's a good client worth to a litigator? <laughs> as much as they can get, right? <laughs> Do you think that a lawyer should pay, the, you know, at least a fraction of one good client? What if they got one more good client this year because they, they improved their website? At least, at least, okay, so. That's more basic. 
So what if it's a different type of price, like it's a restaurant, a burger shop or a restaurant. Now they are de very dependent on having a steady flow of traffic, right? They need really good search optimization. They need really good access to their menu, maybe some ordering. It could, could be more complicated. Um, what's a good day or a good week worth to a restaurant? What if they didn't have that good day or didn't have that good week? What happens to restaurants when they don't get the traffic? We've all seen, now in Santa Clarita, it's like almost, we have a foodies group on Facebook and restaurants go out of business literally every week, right? So a restaurant is really dependent on having excellent marketing from day one, get butts and seats, get people in the door. They need high throughput of those um, tickets to get through. So what's a good client worth to you is a really important way of getting to the value that and, and, and stacking the the value story for the client. It's like, what if you could use this, right? And, and it was attracting more clients to you. What if it got you one, two, three more big clients? What if it got you uh, 10 more good days in a year? What does that mean to you? And that's a way of getting out of the lowest price bid conversation and into the, this is how it's gonna help your business conversation. Um, what's the main job this website needs to accomplish for your business? <laughs> especially going back to that MVP uh, conversation, uh, a website, especially when you're doing the first project, needs to go to one single focus. What is the outcome you want? And then the other things can be added in, but the singular drive to the end focus, is it getting a lead? Is it um, selling product? Is it... Um, getting to uh, the point where they're making a, a, an appointment, right? Have one singular objective in that website. That is the, the primary focus. Get that chunk done first and then add other things to it um, so that you really get them to admit that up front is super important. And if they get that, you actually help them prioritize that way. You've just tr added tremendous value to their business. And then also ask what they like or dislike about your current uh, about their current site. Many do have a website, and many do have a bad website. <laughs> so you can see what they've had and what worked and what didn't work. And then also um, inspiration sites, like uh, sites in their industry or sites at um, businesses they've noticed that they really like the design of or they really like the functionality of. And always be listening. Um, objections are good. Objections in the sales process means they're engaged. It means that they're still deciding, <laughs> that they haven't said no yet in their mind. Objections mean that they're sorting through their own priorities and there's something else bothering them. So ask about the real concern behind the objection. Is it, if it's a time objection, you know, what, what is it about the timeline that is still bothering you? What is it about the price that's still bothering you? What is it about the um, the content limits that maybe somebody else was putting on you um, that you find objectionable. How can we figure out a way around that? And if you can get through their objections, you have the business. If you care about understanding and addressing the client's need more than you care about making a huge, like maximizing the first sale, um, you are going to have this business. Um, then you can agree on a scope, price, and timeline for that first phase that works for uh, everybody. Yes. Ta-da! Oh yay, my fonts are not right. <laughs> yeah, it's okay, it's good, it's good. One and out right around the Look how beautiful they were, okay. <laughs> yay! Okay, so protect your scope. Scope creep is like my number one um, enemy in WordPress projects, right? Because people have ideas every day. Because it takes time to build a site. And so really explaining to the client up front that the clarity of what's in the scope of this first project and what is not is super important to define up front. And having a process for adding scope, which you know, in um, enterprise software land, scope creep is the big term, right? You have to have a firm um, sense of what's in scope, what's out of scope, what's an additional project or an additional um, piece of scope and then you write up another little sheet and say we're adding the scope it costs this much money you get them to sign off because if you just keep adding things and try to build them at the end <laughs> chaos chaos and terror um, it's a rain of fire I don't don't um, 
how to uh, advise that. And this helps you to guard, guard your team's value and time so that you're not off doing all these tangents and I uh, call them uh, goat rodeos, right? You just don't want to be involved in that. You have to you really, even if it seems like it's an emergency, even if it seems like it's the last thing, you have to be in control of this client relationship and explain how um, this can work. Now, I'm not saying don't be flexible, don't be helpful, but charge for your value and definitely get approval in writing. Um, and always be testing. Now this goes for your own site. Always be testing your own site, but also their site because one thing that goes wrong at the, you know, as you're going to launch it and suddenly you lost all credibility, you just work super hard. So make sure that you have a good testing process at the end. Um, uh, frustrated clients talk to other potential clients. You know, this thing want to happen. And the lines, always be good. Make sure that you are um, checking um, set up when somebody's talking about them online congratulate them or warn them hey you've got a bad review how can we address that let's talk about reputation management let's see if there's another service we can help you with and proactively respond um, and the other piece of always be Googling that's kind of fun is once I um, was referred to the uh, retirees group for Lockheed Martin called the Stardusters. And this is super fun. It was, you know, um, a, a board of a dozen retirees, average age 70, but all engineers, can you imagine, right? The amount of detail questions they had for me. <laughs> and we're sitting around in a board style table and I'm explaining WordPress to them, which you know, this is not rocket science, but it is, you know, something that it takes a little bit to explain. And one guy's on his computer the whole time and he's typing and typing and I'm wondering like, what's up with this guy? He seems so disengaged, but everybody else is asking awesome questions. And about halfway through the meeting, he goes, wow, I'm on page 10 and I haven't found anything bad about you yet. <laughs> <laughs> so he was live searching for me and my company name while I was interviewing with them. And that is, that is the world we live in now. I did get the job, so we, they've been clients for several years now. Now their average age is 75, and we're, <laughs> we're still doing enhancements for them. Uh, they have a massive membership site, and it's um, using Woo uh, Commerce and Woo Member. So it's just, it's really important that you keep your online reputation clean. Um, and make your proposal simple. How many of you spend a lot of time on proposals, like massive 15-page documents? Do you, have you ever watched your customers flip through your proposal? Where do they go? The price. <laughs> they don't care about all that stuff you wrote. They really, really don't. So we're really overdoing it. I would say have a you know what to expect document and, and have a good contract, a good agreement. But all of that work to do like fancy, beautiful proposals, simplify and streamline as much as possible because they just don't care. If they've seen good samples of your work, if they know you, they're hiring you and your team and you as a trusted advisor, they're not hiring your ability to create a 15-page document. I promise you. And you're going to be terrified the first time you send out a streamlined proposal. But when you win it, <laughs> and when they appreciate the clarity with which you delivered it, you're going to um, thank me later. And you can you know, tweet at me or something and say, that worked. I can't believe it. <laughs> um, so stick to the basics. Customize a bit to the client's brand and needs. Keep it short and sweet. And don't keep a hot lead waiting because you don't have time to produce a 20-page proposal. I promise you, they're going to appreciate your, um, your clarity and your speed. Okay. Now, the other thing that I see as a mistake for people building is they spend a lot of time on consulting and educating, and that has value. If you offer to sit in a half a day meeting with a client to discover their needs and to come up with a requirements document for them, that has value. And you're gonna be like, oh, I don't know if I can charge for that time. And I'm telling you, they will pay for it if you position it the right way. 
If you say, listen, this is the goal of this time where I'm going to produce a document for you that you can then take and shop out to anybody that you want, but you'll also find out how it is to work together. Whoa, you just relieved all pressure and you might have gotten four or $500 for building that initial requirements document with them and meeting their team and getting to know them versus wasting your whole day and wondering if they're ever gonna buy a project from you. And I hope that changes your lives a little bit because this is really, this, this discovery scope could be um, the way of, <laughs> of actually winning more clients in the long run. They will appreciate that you didn't pay them, uh, that you didn't ask them to pay for the full site before knowing how it is to work with you and before knowing what they needed. And you'll you know, improve your cash flow and your time management. Keep your terms simple. Now, some projects are small and some projects are large. I really have a hard time doing projects without a deposit. I would not do that. And, um, you know, having milestones is great in a larger project and really being clear about this is when the payments happen. Now, for some sites and for some businesses, it doesn't even make sense to have milestone projects. They don't understand what a milestone is. They just don't get that. And so sometimes I do it based on time. And I'll say it's 50% now and 50% on this timeline and this date. And that is because managing their response to you is on them to be responsive, right? And so it's a tricky subject, but I have had a completion payment a good two months before they actually finish approving their content. And that is just how we set it up at the beginning of the project, and it's fair because they're, they know that they're not responsive, right? So that's, that's just a suggestion, but definitely make sure you get a good um, deposit up front. You don't want to be doing a lot of work without knowing that they're going to pay you. If you are a theme-oriented um, person, like I am, and I have a friend that is vehemently anti-theme, <laughs> so you might be in that camp too, but I love a good theme. I do not like, uh, you know, in the past I used to spend, you know, a couple hours going out and searching for the best theme and what makes most sense for this business, and I, you know, I could just really get wound up in this. And now I use um, one to three themes that we've used repeatedly, and I just show different, you know, versions of them um, to see what the customer likes if they haven't already given me um, an inspiration site. Um, but I do really like for them to give me sites that they like and features that they admire and, and layouts that they think are really great so that I understand their taste, their aesthetic, and that makes it a lot easier to give them something they love. Make sure you get that design direction approved. Lay out one page for them, say, do you like it? versus, oh my gosh, like get, oh, um, getting the whole um, site done in one design and then suddenly, oh my gosh, you know, they, they hate it. They need everything changed, right? And how do you keep communication flowing with a client? Make sure you have a weekly schedule where you say, I'm gonna call you and or update you on this schedule I'm, you know, I'm committing to you. I'm going to use plain English as I describe things to you. We're going to have a big conversation. It's not going to be too techy because some clients are super afraid of the techy parts of this. Um, and they will really appreciate that. And then three minutes? Is that what it is? Okay. Or, or does that mean that's a three out of five from the Russian judge? <laughs> I don't know what's happening. Okay. <laughs> All right, and help them understand um, what to look for in the stage you need. So growing the business from freelancer to agency, like if you're one person, you're doing everything, you're getting burned out, you can't go on vacation, it's feast or famine, if you can't sell fast enough and deliver fast enough, as you start to grow, you may be able to take on more clients, six to 12 clients, and get a more consistent workflow going. You start to specialize your resources and build teams around design, developing, account management, content creation. Um, it gets to be a little bit easier, but making that leap from one to two is super hard, and then to beyond. Now, 
Um, the good thing is that you can find a lot of freelancers that are willing to work with you on a project basis and I recommend before you jump into like all these full-time resources to have a more elastic staffing model and to find some really trustworthy freelancers who, you, who want to get business from you on a regular basis. And tell people what to do, what, what you do. Always be sharing what you do and how you do it and your client projects, um, not just when it's slow, because that's the tendency is like, oh, I don't have any projects next month. I better start telling people what I do. Um, but always, right? Always have that as a steady drumbeat of your business. Um, oh man, I had some more stuff here, but um, some good, I'm gonna give you some last things. Um, we didn't get to steam work, but you could ask me questions about that. Lining up clients, here's one of my best strategies, the ugly Betty strategy. Now, people used to come up to me in the street when the show first came out and say, hey, you're ugly Betty, and I was like, what? <laughs> like, I didn't know what this was. But anyway, I'm gonna call this the ugly Betty strategy. It's time. Okay, it's the last one. Look for, if you're at a trade show, look at an ugly booth, or find an ugly website, find an ugly ad, that's your client. They need you, right? <laughs> Okay. Oh, <laughs> I can put on my glasses and get braces. Okay. <laughs> so that's one of the best strategies. I guess we'll open it up for questions and you can ask me like anything else. I can go over other specialties here and uh, tell you more about Seamark. Whoops, at the end. Can you get your website? Can you get your PowerPoint? Um, maybe, yeah, we can figure that out. I think they have it now. <laughs> you want to ask a question? Sure. Yeah, for sure. We can do that. Yes. How long did it take you to go from freelancer to agent? To, to um, you know, if how long did it take me? Well, as long as it took me to realize I didn't want to do everything by myself, so I started to find a good crew of probably at any given time four or five freelancers that I could rely on to be consistent in delivering a product. So I, I, pre I decided to do that early. I've been working with some of them like six or seven years at least and referred them on to other clients and everything too so that they got that steady work going too because as an owner of an agency you really do feel responsible if you can't supply them with enough work then you feel kind of guilty that you are not keeping them going but um, we have a lot of uh, you know we have a lot of good people in our network now that we do send work to pretty regularly so um, right now I'm not actively running um, a hardcore big WordPress agency my business has shifted a lot but we still do WordPress and support our existing clients okay so that four to $500 discovery phase you're talking about? Yeah. So it, the goal of that phase is the requirements document that just gives you a detailed scope of what is going to be um, in, the in the project and then estimates associated with it. So, the, so it's, in a way, it's helping them help, um, decide what a project should cost and how to communicate a good forms project to anybody else. So they could take that document and they could say, okay, great, now that we've fleshed this out, give me three bids. But most of the time they won't want to because they like working with you already. Does that make sense? So on a bigger project, I think it's a super valuable way of if they're like, well, we're not ready, we're not ready, we don't know what we want, to say, well, great, why don't we do you know, 500,000, 2,000, whatever the number is. Uh, it, relative to the what you think the long-term size of the project would be because some projects could be 20 25 it just depends on like how complex the business is um, do like a 10 percent project up front to get to that scope does that make sense yeah cool yeah oh yes uh, you were talking about designing the science of the client life yes like yes how do you balance that with if you determine that what they're oh, that's an awesome um, question and to show insight in the questions up front with the client to talk about the segments that they serve is really important right so um, 
Especially the older woman who may not mm -hmm. really know what websites are on. You might know what right. features are going to feature on the Right. So does a six-year-old woman who's been making wedding cakes her whole life know what a you know, 20 to 30-year-old bride wants? Well, probably because she's talked to you know, thousands of 30-year-old brides. But does she know what that looks like from a web perspective? Right. So it's, um, I have a phrase in my contract that I actually borrowed from a, another friend of mine who runs a uh, WordPress shop too. And it was, we reserve the right, um, in our professional opinion, to push back on you when we believe that you're you know, making the wrong decision. <laughs> like We want to have that healthy dialogue in order to get to the best outcome for you and to serve your clients. Does that you're make sense? I really do have that built into my agreement because I want to set that expectation <coughs> up front that we know what we're doing. We know, you know what you're doing. You make amazing cakes, full stop. Like we, we honor and cherish that, right? But we know what we're doing because we've built you know, hundreds of sites. And we, we know what the trends are. We know what works. We want to make sure that we're doing the best job for you. Just like you know more about buttercream than I do, <laughs> we know more about WordPress than you do, right? <coughs> so I do build that <laughs> into, it's an interesting perspective and maybe not something everybody's been comfortable or thought about before, but when I saw that clause, I was like, oh, that is, that is getting adapted for my use because it's awesome. Okay. That's it? And that's it. Okay, Russian judge says it's time to go. <laughs> this was maybe the weirdest talk ever, but thank you for your attention and good questions. <laughs>